see more of that. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, Harvey. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for coming along. Um, thank you, Michael, um, as well. Um, it's a colossal privilege to be invited to speak to the program on constitutional government, or as I like to think of it, um, um, Harvey in institutional form. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very grateful to him for that. I'm also grateful to him personally because he's been a great supporter um, as well as a great Burke scholar uh, uh, of mine and of the book um, and of this event. And so I'm, I'm grateful to you, Harvey, for this event. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, on the website, it says that um, um, the book has been responsibly acclaimed. <laughs> it's a very Mansfieldian <laughs> phrase. Because what I'm really looking for is irresponsible <laughs> acclamation. Um, but responsible acclamation will serve until the irresponsible <laughs> that's kind that's <laughs> com com <laughs> comes, comes along. Exactly. Um, um, so what I'll do, uh, with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, is I'll speak for half an hour or so to get some ideas on the table and then uh, take any questions you might like to uh, ask. Of course, this being Harvard, I'll pitch it up a little bit. Um, I hope that's uh, OK. Um, but uh, uh, you know, these are not just about ideas, but ideas have political implications as well. So I'll talk a little bit about the history, a little bit about the philosophy, a little bit about the politics. And, and hopefully, there's something in there of interest. Um, th so this is the book. The book is, um, is really uh, a. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a biography, but it's really also an attempt to depict this extraordinary man, Edmund Burke, uh, in, his, in his own context, uh, his life, his times, uh, and his, um, as it were, generation. And as you, as you know, he's born in 1730, uh, dies in 1797, and therefore he's part of this extraordinary generation um, of thinkers uh, that include, uh, you know, without being too particular about timing, um, Dr. Johnson, Adam Smith, David Hume, you know, these are all people he knows and is in discussion and debate with. Um, also, he has this memorable dining club, uh, well, not his, of course, but Dr. Johnson's club, The Club, as it's called, set up the Turk's Head Tavern in Soho, 1764, and uh, to provide conversation for Dr. Johnson. And the other members of this dining club include uh, Joshua Reynolds, great painter David Garrick, who's leading a naturalistic revolution in theatre at the time, uh, Oliver Goldsmith, wonderful Irish playwright, She Stoops to Conquer. Um, and so it's just an, it's an amazing galaxy of talent, a kind of efflorescence of talent um, in which Burke finds himself. And so I try, I try to tell a story in the book about, about some of these people and, and bring it alive as well. And, and one of the things extraordinary about Burke is that his, his thought in my argument, and people can differ on this, doesn't actually, you know, the, the, the foundational basis of his thought doesn't really change much over 30 or 40 years that he's in and around politics. Um, and he fights a series of campaigns from similar or, or identical sort of intellectual premises all the way through. And these campaigns are for uh, what you might call fairer treatment of the Catholics in Ireland. Uh, famously for the rights of the colonists uh, in America, uh, for uh, uh, restrictions on the royal prerogative and on the power of what we would call the power of the executive within British government, uh, for uh, a, a re the responsible exercise of private power in India, where the East India Company has taken over control of the Indian economy and society, and if, they, you know, if you think of the East India Company, just think of um, you know, uh, Google and Microsoft and uh, a number of large security firms and uh, a whole bunch of other companies all you know, mixed together. And you get a conception of what the East India Company is able to do in terms of power. And also a conception of its domestic political power in Britain in the 1770s and 1780s. Uh, and then finally, of course, he... he he, he is a very, very strong critic, the first and the most pungent critic of the French Revolution. Um, and we can explore, if you like, whether or not there are tensions in these positions, as some have thought. But I would argue that all these views are, all these positions are motivated by, by one central dominating passion, which is an absolute detestation of the abuse of power um, uh, and a, a belief that power must be held accountable uh, if it is to be properly exercised. 
Um, and so the book is something which tries to blend the history of that with my own experience as a working politician and also someone who writes quite a lot of journalism, as Harvey's mentioned, and, uh, uh, and, and um, someone who used to teach philosophy, although not political philosophy. Um, and it tries to take the, the reader through the life um, uh, and then to say, after hopefully a tolerably rollicking narrative, um, there are some ideas concealed under here, and take, let me take you by the hand, and we'll explore some of these and see where they lead and where they have contemporary implications. Um, uh, so, um, and, and some of it is quite fun. Let me just read you a, an excerpt from the book. We'll give you a sense of um, what elections are like in the 18th century, um, just as a little vignette. Um, it also gives you a sense of the contrast between Britain now and Britain then. Um, at the very least, voters uh, expected to be lavishly wined and dined uh, or treated by the different candidates in an election. Treating remains an electoral offence today, but only if alcohol or meat are involved. It is an oddity of English law that vegetarians and teetotalers cannot be treated. In the 18th century, however, treating was endemic. You have to understand, um, uh, uh, these were the days of open ballots. Um, uh, uh, treating was uh, endemic. And since elections often took weeks to conclude, the cost could be ruinous. In fighting for Chester in the year 1784, the Grosvenor family paid for 1,187 barrels of ale, 3,756 gallons of rum and brandy, and over 27,000 bottles of wine. These were pretty heroic numbers for a seat with just 1,500 voters. <laughs> Um, so it's quite a, it's, been a, it's a fun thing to research, you can imagine, as well as to talk about. Um, and of course, I'm finding the whole, I mean, I'm relatively new to the, to the I'm not new to the book business, I'm, I'm new to the successful book business. Um, I, had a, I had a moment, um, I'm not expecting this to be replicated, but I had a moment where I was doing my first book signing, having given a talk, and someone, the first person comes up to me. I'm, I mean, I'm hiding behind a kind of ziggurat of books, um, um, feeling slightly nervous. And this very distinguished elderly gentleman comes over to me and says, um, could you tell me the way to the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is, is start uh, not with Burke, but with Hobbes. Um, um, this is a Department of Government. Let's start with Hobbes. Um, and, and you will recall, possibly not directly, that um, Hobbes in the Leviathan lays out um, a foundational conception of legitimate government. And th that is one that is based on uh, a, a positive state of nature in which um, uh, man is set in competition with man. It is what he calls the war of all against all. And such is its ferocity that life in the state of nature is famously solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And uh, Hobbes's answer to this, as you know, is to, uh, is to uh, suggest that um, individuals rationally come together uh, and uh, agree a social contract in which they yield some of their self-sovereignty to a sovereign authority, um, and that this sovereign authority then allows, as it were, the peaceful development of society um, by guaranteeing internal order and external borders. Um, now, that is such a familiar conception of, as it were, the social contract as we've come to understand it. It's become kind of foundational for our thinking. And it has this wonderful quality of um, being rather game theoretic before several centuries before game theory was even contemplated, right? So, so you have this ultra-thin set of assumptions about um, there are only two entities in the game, if you like. There's the state um, 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 as an, uh, well, there's what there were only individuals, and then there's the state, as it were, as something that comes out of um, an agreement between the individuals. Um, and it is a, uh, you have thin assumptions about human motivation, the desire to avoid violent death. Um, and 
the result is a theory of legitimate government. I mean, it's fantastic. It's the smallest possible aperture and the largest possible ha rabbit pulled out of the hat, if you see what I mean. And, and it's a kind of, it's a work of genius in its own way. But I want to suggest to you that um, it's, it's also particularly interesting for what it omits. So it omits three things. The first is what you might call a rich conception of a person's internal life, their emotions, their identity, their aspirations, their plans, their dreams, these kinds of things that is not built into the Hobbesian conception. And they don't need to be. It emits what we would call intermediate institutions, all the institutions that sit between the individual and the state. Um, indeed, there's one point at which Hobbes says that you know, the commands of Leviathan are as chains to the individual. There's nothing in between on this conception. Uh, and it builds in a kind of moral presupposition in favor of the state, in favor of, of, of uh, that sovereign authority and against the individual to whom authority has been yielded, from whom, or by whom authority has been yielded. And one way of thinking about Burke is as a, an enormous and systematic corrective and, criti and, and, as it were, critic of this conception of and this theory of legitimate government. So from Burke's standpoint, um, uh, there is no explanatory value to the idea of a state of nature. Um, uh, uh, in particular at all. I mean, man, this is a very, uh, at least on my reading of Burke, it's, it, which is a rather, I think it's fair to say, Aristotelian reading. Um, uh, uh, man is a social animal, what Ar Aristotle would call a political and so on. We can explore what that might mean, if you'd like, a bit later on. Um, but as such, um, man's na natural state is to be in society. There's no, such, there's no sense to be attached to the notion of a state of nature, uh, as it were, antecedent to society. Society is kind of in there from the beginning. In, at least in some form. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, because man is a social animal and is, and is perennially linking, the, there's, a, there's a conception of a richness of, so of, of one's own interior life and, and of these interrelationships that arises naturally from the outset of that view. And um, indeed, that richness is in part what it is is it's constitutive of a person's well-being. They should be able to exercise um, their plans and, and, and live in a, in a free way within, within that society. Um, and that, therefore, freedom lies in, uh, lies in what is afforded by the social order to an individual. Um, and if one was making it, as it were, even more Aristotelian, one would say that individuals in this um, context naturally form habits. Um, those habits are shared, they coalesce over time into practices, those practices become institutions. Uh, and therefore, far from omitting the idea of intermediate institutions, these are a natural development and extension of the, of the conception, the anti-Hobbesian conception that Burke is, is, is offering. And uh, you will, uh, it may be of interest to note that there was a, um, I mean, there is a very, very good example, Burke will have been able to multiply innumerable examples of the constraints which the social order imposes and which are therefore in some sense liberating and offer um, uh, the possibility of living your life freely and well. Um, there was a nice, there's a nice example of that in the previous century because in Britain in 1688, as you may recall, there's the so-called Glorious Revolution. Uh, now, in England, that's more or less bloodless. People refer to it as bloodless revolution, certainly not bloodless if you're living in Ireland or Scotland. Um, but it is, a, it, is a, it is a constitutional shift in which um, William of Orange comes over and is, after some negotiations, made King William III governing jointly with his wife, Mary. Now, the result of that transition which was the creation of a sovereign conception of power of a rather different kind in Britain. Britain had essentially experimented with the, the king ruling in a personal sense, King Charles I, um, uh, a, a control by parliament um, um, uh, after the Civil War, and then controlled by the Lord Protector through you know, the, the army. Um, and each of those had been found to be deficient 
And what this uh, new theory of sovereignty in 1688 does, the, the so-called king in parliament, is that the king remains part of the sovereign authority, but only as constrained by parliament. So it's the constraints of parliament that allow this power to be responsibly exercised. Because power can be responsibly exercised, the king is enabled to borrow. Now, historically, um, the king was perennially short of cash throughout British history. And this is what creates the tension with um, parliament, which is the source of cash through taxation. And the reluctance to consult parliament, because that always meant giving up power for monarchs, meant that they got into the way of essentially um, exacting money from people uh, by forced loans, which never got repaid, or selling monopolies, all of these other things. After 1688, William III, um, everyone trusts that the king is going to repay because parliament's essentially disciplined to do that. The result is that national debt goes through the sky, interest rates fall to the ground, fall very low. We, we, we go through the 18th century, Britain goes through the 18th century, running interest rates at least 2% below French interest rates. You know, that finances the war of the Spanish succession. It then finances the copper bottoming of the British Navy under one of my ancestors in the 1760s. Um, and um, that's the decisive technological innovation that wins the Battle of Trafalgar. So it has a very, very long um, trail. Um, uh, and, and that um, is, I think, a nice example of the way in which, as it were, constraints afford, afford freedoms. The other thing, of course, that comes out of this Burkean conception is an emphasis on institutions, as I've described. And let me just pick up a couple of sets of institutions to give you a sense of how that might be. One of them would be the notion of rights. Now, sometimes there's a very simple-minded view where people say, well, of course, uh, um, uh, conservatives in particular, um, and Burke is often thought of as conservative, as you know, and I would argue is one, um, indeed the first one, conservatives are somehow hostile to rights. They're in favor of freedoms, but they're hostile to rights. Um, and, uh, you know, doesn't Burke have a lot to say about how awful, um, you know, the French Revolution is, and wasn't the French Revolution built on notions of uh, egalité, liberté, and fraternité? Um, and uh, the response to that is, that I uh, know Burke is not against r rights um, by any means, but he has a distinct conception of them. Um, and indeed, he regards property rights as anchoring the social order. So property rights, so rights for him that are acceptable are what he would call recorded rights, rights that are filtered through the common law, that are um, developed over a period of time through human interactions, and that achieve their legitimacy in that, what he would call uh, uh, presumptive legitimacy as a result. Um, against that would be abstract rights, rights that have been divorced from their context, rights that have no, as it were, history behind them, or that are memoryless. Okay, there are kinds of rights that he would see as essentially slogans that you find at the time of the French Revolution. Um, so uh, that would be one kind of uh, institution that Burke, far from being hostile to, has a nuanced conception of. Another one would be the idea of a political party. You may know that Burke in 1770 writes, um, uh, thoughts on the cause of the present discontent, which sets out a theory of political parties. Now, it used to be thought that that theory arose from the fact that he was being supported by these large um, Whig um, fortunes and that he was somehow, therefore, Burke was somehow a, uh, uh, a lackey whose job was to act as the paid mouthpiece of the great Whig aristocrats. We know that's not true. Burke enters Parliament in 1765. Um, eight years before that, he's written an essay in which he scouts a theory of political party that is essentially the one he advances in 1770, long after, I mean, five years after he's entered Parliament. So long before he ever considered going to politics, he's got a theory of party government. Um, and those political parties, for him, far from being what we think of as political parties, that is to say, gathering places for the dishonest the disreputable, um, uh, you know, and the kind of deranged. Um, uh, uh, he thinks of political parties as uh, essential mediating devices that sit, that, that allow the popular temper to be filtered and brought into public deliberation. So, so for him, political parties are um, sources of stability, of openness, debate on public principles, of moderation, checking 
on executive power. They recruit talent into the political world. They prevent the need for statesmen. They uh, uh, are subject themselves to, and, and as it were, the, the independent judgment of, uh, of the individual MP. And uh, as you may recall, he gets uh, um, elected to the plum seat of Bristol in 1774, and everyone's expecting him to turn around and say, thank you so much for electing me. In fact, he turns around and gives them a lecture in which he says, your representative owes you not his industry only, um, but his judgment, and he sacrifices that. Um, uh, 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 he betrays that if he sacrifices it to your opinion. In other words, <laughs> I'm sticking up for what I believe in, and you can go hang. And, and that has become the kind of canonical statement of the responsibilities and the perspective of a, of a, of a representative as opposed to a mere delegate in, a, in Parliament. Um, and it's only a slightly ironic moment, that, uh, uh, fact to contemplate, that Burke himself, unfortunately, um, does not discharge um, uh, his own edict, his own injunctions very well. He says that the representative should be in the closest correspondence of his constituents um, and should consult their interests first and always ahead of his own. But unfortunately, he himself only visited Bristol three times in six years. So it wasn't what you would call the model of an effective and successful <laughs> constituency. MP. Um, so, so Burke's is a philosophy of institutions, um, and uh, I think it's I think it's Aristotelian in that sense as well, because um, it is a it, it's an Aristotelian idea that, um, it, as it were, um, the uniqueness of man lies in his or her capacity to deliberate about his own self-government, uh, and. Uh, that is a, it is a kind of Burkean extension of that thought to think of parties as the means by which that public deliberation can be sustained and um, stabilized and enlarged and therefore the public realm and the realm of public debate um, simultaneously I uh, expanded and protected. Going alongside that, I would argue, is a, is a kind of anti uh, 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 is, a, is, is a, a huge nervousness and concern about the status of reason itself. Bur Burke is an Enlightenment figure. As you can imagine, he's continuously arguing for his case in many different ways. Um, he's, he's, he's one of the pioneers of political communications at the time, which is why, although he doesn't spend much time in government, he has this extraordinary reputation internationally um, uh, for his positions in support of the colonists, uh, in particular, his great speeches on conciliation and taxation, which he published. Um, uh, now, those, those are uh, many landmarks in political communication. It was unusual for people to publish their own speeches in that way, and it assured him an international reputation, even as a backbencher. Um, and um, so he is committed to reason in the proper exercise of its, um, of its uh, capability, but not to reason overstepping those bounds. Uh, and uh, so his conception of political principle is always contextualized. He has a great line where he says, circumstances give to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. That is to say, you can't just take a principle. It's like rights. You can't divorce it from its circumstances. You have to make a judgment in the circumstances. And those circumstances will then determine, in part, which principles are applicable. Um, and therefore, there's a kind of reflector e equilibrium that the, that the governor must strike as between principle and circumstance in deciding what judgment uh, to make. Um, but I, I would argue that his, his, uh, his, his concern about rationalism uh, uh, goes well uh, beyond this. Um, and if I may, what I'll do is just quote a little bit um, from that. He says, um, he says, um, according to Burke, uh, it is a deep mistake in logic to apply abstract principles out of context to human affairs. This is a quote, Aristotle, the great master of reasoning, cautions us, and with great weight and propriety, against this species of delusive geometrical accuracy in moral arguments as the most fallacious of all sophistry. In other words, universal principles are never sufficient in themselves to guide practical deliberation. Their imposition always involves a degree of fallacy or logical error. When Burke talks about the age of sophisters, he says, you know, he says, the age of chivalry is dead. 
and he talks about so uh, sophisters, economists, and calculators in the age of chivalry is dev dead and the reflections on the revolution in France. And I think it is that, it's that rationalizing appetite for slogans and for principles divorced from context that he's thinking of. And there's interesting comparison to be drawn with Jefferson. The result of that is that you can't actually, fa if we extend that thought now, it's actually a, a critique in advance of the attempt during the 19th century to found politics on the idea of science. It's a kind of Benthamite, um, utilitarian attempt to find a kind of rational calculus that could ground um, deliberation in a quasi-scientific way. Um, and uh, the, the counterpart of that is, is that when it comes to the supreme moment in, uh, uh, in British history, which is the, uh, during his lifetime, uh, which is after the fall of the Bastille, when France is in turmoil, and the whole of Britain is um, actually, on the whole, excited about this, regarding it as a potential transition, and the likely transition 100 years after the Glorious Revolution to a new form of constitutional government. It is, it is Burke who, it almost immediately, and only Burke, who says, you don't understand. He says, this is not um, anything to be pleased by or delighted by. This is a disaster. What, what, what we are seeing is um, uh, the harbinger of bloodshed and violence and uh, uh, war and civil war and ultimately tyranny. And what is so fascinating is that he says this in the revolutions in France with an uncanny prediction of the rise of Napoleon, um, three years before Napoleon's on anyone's radar screen, uh, uh, which, you know, po Napoleon really only hits the radar, as it were, the public radar screen in 1793 when he, when he as it were, it, uh, the siege of Toulon. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, this is three years before that, and Burke has been in his grave for four years um, by the time Napoleon becomes Emperor of France and Master of Europe. So it's an extraordinary act of kind of anticipation and prophecy. Um, and I think it gives Burke a, a certain status as a theorist, not merely of revolution in its classic enlightenment sense, that is of the revolving world returning to, as it were, a terminus, a place uh, a, p a previous state of affairs, but of revolution as a total change in circumstance, the, a total social change that sweeps all before it. Um, let me round up quickly. The counterpart of that is Burke's own conception of, uh, of society, and I think it's this that gives him um, some contemporary interest and relevance. Um, Burke is a conservative, but he's not a conservative in the way that any of us would currently recognize it given the terms of public debate now. He's not a theocon or a neocon, okay? Um, he's, he's, uh, uh, um, he's not a, a, a Thatcherite or a Reaganite. Um, Burke is a conservative because Burke thinks that society is a partnership between the, the dead, the living, and those to be born. Um, that is to say, it is a trust which each generation inherits which it is its job to sustain and enhance and to pass on to the next generation. Uh, and that this imposes a, a, a requirement on political and other leaders to be modest in the way they present themselves and in their own ambitions, not to consult. Here's a great line about Lord North. He says, Lord North is a man who consults his invention and rejects his experience. Um, and, and so, uh, 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 in other words, um, he's rejecting uh, in advance things that we would regard now, many would regard now, as commonplace. For it. So Burke is rejecting in advance the idea that happiness uh, lies in the satisfaction of human wants. Um, he's rejecting in advance the idea that the function of society is somehow to satisfy those wants. For Burke, um, society um, is... Uh, a means of satisfying, um, uh, preserving a social order that meets the needs not merely of, of this generation, but of previous ones and the future ones. It's that, it's that continuity through time, and therefore, far from the arrogance of contemporary politicians, it imposes a conception of, uh, of, of humility um, uh, in the face of the social order and of reform in action and of uh, restraint in one's uh, and modesty in personal conduct, and I put that. To, I think that's radically different from any political conception of government now, let alone um, conservative one. Um, what What are the implications of this now? If we were going to pick up some 
results, and I'll, and I'll just touch on these quickly, and then we'll round up. The first is, I think, is a marvelous corrective to what we would think of as the extremes, extreme liberalism, the evils of extreme liberalism. Um, you know, we've just gone through a, a financial crisis, um, uh, uh, unleashed in part by um, a set of institutional arrangements that are governed by and responding to human greed. And Burke is a fantastic critic of, of that. Um, homo economicus um, um, has no place within a Burkean conception of human well-being. Um, the second is, he insists that gov all government must be with the, with the, the temper of the people. The temper is an interesting word. He doesn't mean just focusing on the interests of the people. He doesn't mean running it on the back of opinion polling or, as it were, any contemporary assessment of their views from any given time. The temper of the people is, is a, is a, uh, is a, um, uh, a longer term and slightly more distal conception. Um, but but the, the reforming uh, spirit that I've described is a corrective to the great policy disasters of the last few years. You know, whether it be, you know, the Kennedy White House, which you know, assembles the best and the brightest and ends up in Vietnam, or, you know, the genius Harvard economists from the Institute of International Economics um, or, in or International Development, who uh, Jeff Sachs and co, who do so much damage to um, Poland in the, in the 1980s, where I was at the time, I might add, and uh, Russia uh, in the uh, 1990s, um, or to this kind of spirit of liberal interventionism that takes people into Iraq without thinking about what it would be to abolish a social order and try and replace it at the point of a gun. I mean, you know, these are all things that a Burkean conception would, at the very least, caution against. Um, Euro uh, um, um, folks might be interested, in the Eurozone would, would come across as a kind of rationalist folly for a Burkean conception, in my view. Um, it's a corrective to um, an over-reliance on expertise or what we might think of as geometrical thinking. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, much more sympathetic to con modern conceptions of social capital and social value. Um, so on this view, then, the uh, abuses of power are to be restrained, whether they be the nabobs of India in the 1760s and 70s or the modern financial nabobs of Wall Street or the City of London. Um, uh, and what's fascinating about that is that it's an anti elites, it's a critique of these self-serving elites, but from the right of the political spectrum, not from the left of the political spectrum. I think that gives it remarkable interest. Um, uh, and and uh, um, what arises, I think, ultimately is not a, is, is not merely something negative, but a, a much richer conception of the possibility of moral community, of the importance of society, the importance of human culture, and um, uh, uh, the way in which institutions, be they institutions of parliament or institutions of um, uh, uh, civil society, can form the basis of um, human well-being and human flourishing when we're allowed to live in an orderly way and not find ourselves subject to individual liberties one by one, but the general liberty of a life lived freely. Thank you very much. Do you want a um, mic? If it's not possible to write a mic to be muted for us, then <laughs> that is the recording for us. Oh, just for our program. So what do you do with it? <laughs> we put it in the archive. <laughs> so far, we haven't done anything with it. You remember that scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where you they say, yeah. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> Delete the expletives, Michael, and then re-ask the question without the expletives. Yeah. Well, uh, I think this is by way of preface to the question. I, th I think that Jesse Norman's book on Burke is a, a terrific uh, work of political theory and political biography uh, uh, connected. And, and it brings, uh, so I think it's, it should be required reading for everyone in this room. I also think it offers a, um, uh, 
a rich uh, corrective, and Jesse, you spoke about Burke as himself a corrective, to um, much contemporary political discourse and argument. And I would also like to add, at the risk of embarrassing the Jesse, by way of uh, preface, that Burke aside, Jesse is himself, I think, one of the most philosophically reflective politicians anywhere um, in the world today. And I think it's. Um, uh, you it's should add, Michael, it's not a hotly contested <laughs> category. <laughs> 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 you think the competition is not severe. <laughs> um, and so my question is really about the teachings of Burke, of, of, of Jesse Norman's Burke, for contemporary politics. And the second half of the book is really devoted to, to this. Um, and it's, it's clear that the conservative vision that emerges from the book and from your telling, mm -hmm. Jesse, is one that's informed by um, Burkean and Aristotelian understandings of, of practical wisdom, of the common good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it includes a critique of liberal individualism, uh, as that view uh, has emerged since the mm -hmm. contractarian tradition, mm -hmm. the Enlightenment. Uh, utilitarianism, mm. um, all of which predominate in contemporary public discourse. Mm. Um, my question is what the teachings of this Aristotelian, Burkean conservatism, what, what its implications are for contemporary conservative politics. And to sharpen the, the question, um, but in a way that won't surprise you at all, um, if one looks at the most successful, the two most successful conservative political figures of our time, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, mm. they succeeded in, or they apparently succeeded in uh, rejuvenating conservative uh, politics as a governing uh, ideology or public philosophy, um, arguably by flying in the face of everything that one learns from the conservative vision that you articulate, I think in a compelling, eloquent way in the book. Not only um, uh, because each of them was a, uh, embraced a kind of unfettered free market, but even in a more thoroughgoing philosophical way, as for example, when Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no such thing as society. And as when Ronald Reagan said, in it was either his uh, acceptance speech at the convention or perhaps it was in his inaugural, Harvey will know for sure. Um, when he s ended his speech, it may have been his first inaugural, by quoting the arch rival of, of philosophically of Edmund Burke, Thomas mm. Paine. Mm. And, and Ronald Reagan uh, cited Paine, saying, we have it in our power to make the world over again, which is precisely the, the opposite conception of politics from the one that we find in Edmund Burke. How do you account for the fact that these two um, great figures of modern conservative politics apparently succeeded um, despite the fact that they um, root and branch rejected the Aristotelian Burkean understanding of conservatism that you so powerfully and I think rightly and eloquently articulate and revive mm. in this book. Uh, well <laughs> Thank you for that, Michael. Um, uh, 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 okay, so, so let's just talk a little about um, the way you introduced the question, and then I'll talk about the question. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, and you use the phrase practical wisdom. I think that's exactly right. And um, if we were being really scholarly about the notion of practical wi wisdom, y you will have noticed that that quotation I used about Burke actually maps onto Aristotle's notion of the practical syllogism. 
So practical syndicalism has, has, a, has, a, has a major premise, which is a principle, and a minor premise, which is a context, uh, um, or a set of circumstances. And that's exactly what, what Burke is essentially doing by saying that um, circumstances uh, give to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. So he's, he's doing something which I don't think we really noticed, quite subtle there. Um, uh, that's just a scholarly point for a Harvard audience. But, uh, uh, just, uh, um, but it does also mean that it gives him a fascinating character of, of being um, uber-nuanced about the limitations of this rationalizing thought in advance. And therefore, he's not merely a kind of pivot of modern politics. He's also, in a bizarre way, uh, the first of the postmodern, although I would say not postmodernist, critics. So the, the, you know, the, 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 he, he is a, a critic of the modern before it actually happens. Um, the, the, on Reagan and Thatcher, the, the, the differences, I think there are different important differences in each case which are worth looking at. Um, if you remember, I mean, b b both Reagan and Thatcher are um, uh, in many ways not very conservative at all. Um, now, in, in Reagan's case, um, and as you will recall at the time, you know, when Reagan came, and I was w working in Washington, um, this <laughs> dates me, um, at one point when, when at the end of his presidency, um, you know, Reagan arrives on the back of a supply side revolution, which is an economically driven conception of how government ought to be remade. And on this view, um, uh, uh, debt is not only acceptable, it's important because it fetters, it sets a hard budget constraint which prevents you know, liberals from spending government money on things they shouldn't be spending it on. That was part of the argument that was used at the time. At the same time, markets get massively unclogged, um, and, and there's an argument about sclerosis on the supply side of the economy, which is being made. It's an economic argument. Um, uh, uh, now, some of that is, uh, I think, compatible with the Burkean view, an emphasis on free institutions, getting the state out of the way of some of these things. That's a, uh, thoroughly it seems to me congenial to many of the things we're talking about. Burke has a, uh, a, a, an essay where he talks about the supply of corn during the uh, uh, in run up to the Revolutionary War. And, and he says it's very important that the state not, in, not interfere with that um, process and that markets be allowed to function. And Smith and Burke have this remarkable kind of parallelism of thought where Smith writes the theory of moral sentiments, which is remarkably similar in some interesting ways to what Burke thinks about notions of human affinity and, as it were, um, um, sociality. Um, and, and Burke has you know, very Smithian ideas about, about markets and institutions. Um, and there's a nice moment where Smith says, you know, that Burke is the only man who thinks exactly as I do on economic matters without any communication passing between us. And that's a nice kind of a nice sign. Uh, uh, um, so. What's interesting about so that's Reagan. In Thatcher's case, you have a, a, a context in which there's a genuine question as to who's in charge in Britain. You know, are the unions in charge of Britain, or is legitimate authorized government after an election in charge of Britain? And um, uh, uh, and so, although both in their own way are are um, liberta liberal libertarian figures, Thatcher less than less than you might think. Thatcher is more of a constitutionalist than people often realize. She was slow to act in the first few years of her uh, thing. She carries her, her, her colleagues with her. She's respectful of parliament. She's respectful of cabinet. She's respectful of the institutions of government. I mean, she, she becomes less respectful over time, but she's, she's some, in some respects more conservative than you might think. Um, but but, but, the, but uh, as you say, they are, they are um, to that extent, not especially Burkean. Now, what's interesting about it is what, you know, it's a parlor game as to how would Burke react to modern, con uh, modern, as it were, circumstances. But I don't, uh, I don't think it's all impossible that a, that a Burkean might say, actually, the situation is so dire in Britain in, in 1979 that extreme measures are required to try to yank the society, yank the economy back to a context in which people can actually go out. You know, we have a country in which, in Britain, uh, the marginal tax rate in some contexts was 83%. You know, you can't, you know, no one can live on a marginal context of 83% in tax. Um, you have a situation in which you can't take more than 50 pounds out of the country without permission. Just think about that. So, so, um, uh, so, so she's really, 
freeing things up, very much in the spirit of allowing people, allowing society to receive a certain balance of its own, allowing legitimate government to flourish in the way that it should do, and allowing, therefore, people to live their lives freely. And what is rather sad is how some people try and blame the modern financial crisis in Britain in, uh, uh, on Mrs. T. Now, in fact, I uh, will spare you a little bit of politics, but uh, there's, that, there's no evidence for that, whatever. The freeing up of the economy of the 1980s is about removing sclerosis, getting markets moving, and allowing people more economic freedom. Um, we can date the crisis, the, financial, the origins of the financial crisis, almost precisely to um, the uh, decisions that were taken uh, at the, um, uh, uh, the end of the 1990s. I mean, you know, in, it's a very boring point, but for connoisseurs of politics, Britain, the banks were leveraged in Britain for 40 years at 20 times. Debt was 20 times that capital for 40 years between 1960 and 2000, okay? 20 times capital. Between 2000 and 2007, it goes to 50 times capital, okay? It's not hard to see where the problem was. Um, so, so now on Reagan, quickly with pain, and I don't want to keep going on about that. Oh, sorry, on no such thing as society, what she's not actually, of course, that's widely misunderstood. She's not saying there's no such thing as society, it doesn't exist, although I think that argument could be made. What she's saying is you shouldn't be preferring some mythical society to the interests of the individuals and the families that compose it. Now, I don't actually think she's right about that. I think society is an institution in the Burkean sense and should be properly understood. Um, um, and you can see she allows intermediate institutions because she talks about families. So I think that's a mistake on her part, but it isn't the, it isn't the as it were, the, the libertarian mistake of saying we can ignore all these things and sweep it away uh, under an economic rubric. Um, as for pain, and, and Reagan, that is, that is a piece of um, highly unnerving um, uh, individual um, assertion of power, which would be, um, yeah, uh, uh, the less said the better. But that's generally true of things which involve pain in my experience. <laughs> In, in America, it is. In, in Britain, the word conservative doesn't sell books. In, in America, they're trying to stir up a culture war, so they like the idea of the first conservative. Yeah, the, the first also in the, the word, I'm thinking from the word first. Actually. Yes, yes. Okay, so the word first is on the UK as well? As no, 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 in England, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, in America, yeah. Okay, so. I'm try is it a worthy title, first conservative? I think it is a word. Okay, good, time. good. That's I'm one of the established that is this. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get uh, to understand and flesh out what is first about Burke. Okay, right. that is to say, I understand from your talk that um, he's first in the sense of opposing the French Revolution, the universalism, the rationalism. Yeah. I'm with you. I agree. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm wondering. I'm a little surprised that you didn't talk a little bit more about his attitude towards history. I mean. Certainly it is there where you talked about common law, the sure. partnership between the past, the present, and the future, sure. things like that. But you know, getting into what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of Burke's thought, sure. um, what would you assess are the advantages and disadvantages of his view of history or the partnership between the past, present, and the future? Uh, okay, thanks for that. Um, uh, I've talked a little bit about the advantages of the of conception of society as a, as a partnership between past, present, and future, I, in that it has a notion of, it, it, it builds in a presupposition of preserving an inheritance, a conception of social value, um, a, a notion of modesty, uh, and a reforming spirit in, amongst those in power. Um, uh, you're absolutely right about history. I mean, I mean the, the, the Burke is imbued in history, and his idea, and I think it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a, an idea that deserves to be taken more seriously, and often is now. Is um, there's somehow a view that uh, when people talk about freedom in one context, they mean the same thing as freedom in another context. You know, as though freedom was just one thing. And what Burke says is actually e every idea has has its own um, trajectory and history, and we have to ask ourselves what exactly do we mean? In a way, it's a fairly philosophical point. What exactly do we mean by these? Um, these great slogans, because if we don't do that, they become slogans, and when you get into slogan world, you're in the world of the French Revolution. You're in the world of preferring something that actually has very little meaning and exploiting its lack of meaning, 
and using it for emotive purposes. And what's fascinating is there's a little known, um, I mean, people don't think of it in the context of his politics, but it's a rather important early work of his, which is his um, inquiry into the origin of the sublime and the beautiful. And what is fascinating about that book, which really repays reading and had a lot of influence in its own time, is how it sets up part of his politics later. So um, he has a theory about the emotive use of words, which anticipates, as it were, the sloganizing of the French Revolution, except that he's, he's, written, he's writing the inquiry in the, um, in the 1750s. Um, and he also has a theory um, uh, of our reaction to, uh, you know, the, the sublime is the, is the quality which elicits uh, a feeling of awe in us, and the beautiful is the quality that elicits a feeling of love. And so the beautiful is what anchors what you might call the social side of human uh, uh, interactions, and um, the, the, the sublime is what elicits, as it were, conceptions of power and respect for power. And so b I think it's fair to say that Burke's view is that our attitude to the social, our social inheritance, the social order we've come into, is one of awe. It is, it, is the ex it is the attitude we have when our minds encounter something that outstrips their capacity to understand them. And it's from that that the, m that the modesty of his, of his theory of, of leadership derives, I would argue. Um, so, uh, as it were, you've, your question opens up a lot of different angles. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, and so he's, he's Burke's obviously very well known for his support for the American revolutionaries and um, this idea of, of prevention of the arbitrary will of an individual over society, so a kind of dis despot. Um, in terms of so from a constitutional angle, so with, from the United States with the Declaration of Independence where those protections are actually written in a constitutional document and those checks and balances are, are you know, free for all to see where, versus Britain where there isn't actually a written constitution and mm -hmm. recently there's been a lot of discussion about it, about it in the political arena. But was he, was he a, an advocate of a similar type of written Bill of Rights in, the, in Britain which would protect the, the kind of freedoms that he was advocating based on the US model? Um, I don't know that Burke wrote about that specific issue, but, or not that I can think of now, but, I mean, his, p his position w would, un I think, pr pretty clearly be in favor of the informal understandings that characterize the British Constitution, mediated by tradition um, over, the, as it were, the, the what he would see as a kind of rationalizing attempt to write them down and pretend that that formula of words captured all of, as it were, the meaning of the, of the context that they were trying to represent. So, um, but, but um, what is fascinating is if you read the speech on conciliation is the enormous respect he has n um, for, uh, uh, and this is why it was read in American schools in the 20th century, for, um, you know, American energy and ingenuity and in particular you know he's very respect you know he was, he's a man who went to the middle temple and then dropped out as you may know um he couldn't really stand the law his father was a solicitor and he tried to get out of it as quickly as he decently could um and um burke um but burke does have a enormously deep flair for the historical reasons we were talking about for the common law and for law as such so he's enormously respectful of the uh, uh legal basis of uh, American statecraft and practical deliberation, and you see that coming about. You know, he he he, you know, they s he has this marvelous thing about how they're all lawyers and they sniff sedition, and, you know, on the breeze, and they're very, you know, they're feisty Americans. It's one. It's a beautiful thing. So so um, he he might be he might have been nervous about the attempt to write the Bill of Rights, um, but he was deeply respectful of the of the energy and and spirit of the people that created it. Rita. Uh, so I think you opened your talk by saying that Burke's overarching concern is, um, as you said, to hold power accountable. Um, and I'm wondering to whom exactly, because on the one hand you explain his theory of representation or his thoughts about representation, that they're not based on delegates or a delegate model. Yes. Uh, as far as I know, he was opposed to expanding the franchise in England. 
Um, and he was also interested in curbing monarchical power, monarchical yes. prerogatives. So to whom uh, is power accountable in this view? Um, OK, it's a very interesting question and a good question. Um, uh, uh, he was opposed to extensions of the franchise um, and disappointed a lot of people on the radical side of British politics who anticipated him as being a kind of natural friend of theirs based on his support for the American colonists. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, his, um, his view is, uh, it, one has to reflect on the nature of British politics. Now. British politics at that time is a very elite activity. Um, you know, people are, it, it's conducted by a very small number of people who are in general extremely highly educated. Um, and um, f for Burke, um, what ratify, what the reason why that's able to work is because the British Constitution contains within it um, a, a natural balancing between the different voices at, which have a stake in, as it were, the, the nature of British society and um, its future. Um, and these balance the long term and the short term and the democratic and the, I mean, he wouldn't think of it in terms of the democratic, but the popular expression of popular feeling and the, um, uh, and the expert and hereditary. And so there's a component between the different elements, so between king, as it is then, the House of Lords, i.e. propertied, um, inherited element, and um, p uh, the commons, the elected um, representative component. Um, now, is he right about that? Well, no, I don't think he is right about that. Um, uh, 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 we would certainly say that um, uh, that um, uh, we, we would certainly ask the question as to whether that uh, set of institutions really could capture the full spread of popular feeling um, that was emerging even at the time. And as you know, there were there were riots periodically in London, and um, there was a tremendous fear about the possibility of mob rule that would occur from any extension of the franchise. So you could see the worries they had. When franchise extension did occur, its effect was to co-opt some of that concern, not to fan it. Um, although there obviously have been people who've made the argument that politics has been, have been as it were, uh, in some sense, made more demotic and therefore in some sense perhaps less effective or less wise than it might be. Um, but, uh, 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 but I, um, I think the, the, the picture that he is talking about, though, which is of a slow, a slowly evolving set of political institutions that, um, uh, as it were, are open to change, but without radical, uh, without radical change, is one. I, I think it. I think a Birkin could perfectly reasonably have have accepted the extension of the franchise in the first Reform Act, for example, in 1832, and. Um, and even conceivably the, the second one. And certainly it was regarded as such at the time. You know, what's fascinating about British politics in the 19th century is that almost wherever you are in the spectrum, you can be a Gladstonian liberal, you can be an Israeli and conservative, you can, you know, and, and you can be a Cobden or a Bright and some of these characters in the middle, um, or off on one side, and they all think Burke is a kind of magazine of wisdom and come back and consult him. So e even, even where they disagree with certain aspects of things he's said. interested in understanding better uh, how you rely on or use Burke in terms of your criticism of contemporary conservatives of different kinds. I understand that Theo, you know, I understand that a Burkean would maybe be opposed to Theocons, American cool. Theocons, that's obvious. Um, and also sort of to these extreme individualist or libertarian strains, Neo-Thatcherite or Reaganites. Um, and of also the Neocons in terms of their, I guess, foreign policy adventurism. This I all get. Mm. but. What about, and it's, nobody loves labels, but the neoconservative so-called figures, who, earlier ones who were reacting against uh, large uh, big state liberal policies, which they thought were you know, failing, failing the poor, failing blacks, uh, failing to do the good they wanted to do. Mm. So p people like who wrote for the public interest, those sorts of conservatives. I'm just wondering sort of how you see yourself as a as a Burkean of a sort in relation to that, because those are those are kind of react in a way those are reactions 
to liberal progressivism of some kind or the welfare mm. state mm. and its programs, which don't, it seems to me, imply financial greed or radical free in individualism mm. or mm. so I, I I mean would that be would that sort of conservatism there's a bit more on the American scene would that be I mean it's Burkean ish it's, or what it's I mean. hard to know um, without tying it down to specifics um, more than you have done so but um, I mean I, I don't think the perspective that I'm describing I mean forget whether it's Burke's view or not but take this broad broadly Burkean conservatism I'm describing I, I don't think that is uh, hostile to some some really, you know, um, you know, to some changes that people would regard as quite right wing in some ways. I mean, I'll give you an example. I don't think it's hostile to benefit reform that has the effect of moving people slowly off a dependence on the state for certain kinds of benefits. It's not. I don't think it's hostile to that at all. That the view would be that um, 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 th what's happened is the extension of these financial rewards has essentially caused a group of people to stop relying on themselves and start relying on on the public wheel or on the public purse um, so I don't I don't think we, we don't need to regard this as kind of lily livered or somehow you know it, it's it's it I think it, it can be quite pungent when the moment comes um, uh, uh, the the w I think the key point is really where the positive emphasis is and the positive emphasis is on the, what a, what shape a flourishing society takes and the free institutions and the moral community that are enabled through it. Um, and so if you look at British politics now, and I don't know if it's true in America, we're, we're obsessed with arguments about the state and about the individual. And we're not having the kind of nuanced arguments about how you make institutions in the middle flourish uh, or assist them to flourish, either by getting out of the way or by supporting them in different ways. And I think that's the argument we need to have. Now, Britain, that argument's enormously enhanced by the fact that we don't have any money. Okay, we're, we're broke. So well, for the, literally, for the first time in a long time in Britain, we have a hard budget constraint. That means the push me, pull you, which says, actually, do you know what? We'll opt out of political deliberation. We'll just spend a lot of money. It looks like we're doing something. People feel good for a while, and then we don't worry about the debt, because frankly, we'll be out of office by then. You know, that's gone. Don't have, you can't do that anymore. So the question is, well, what could we do? Well, we can start thinking about what actually makes people's lives better. And I spent a lot of time thinking about those kinds of things. Um, and, let me, and, and that doesn't, by any means, that also, interestingly enough, that doesn't rule out public spending. And I'll give you an example. I think it would be a really good idea in Britain if we introduced a much more thoroughgoing version of, as it were, citizens' public service. You know, where you come out of school and the, and the expectation is that, that you will be doing something in your community, um, you know, fixing it up, you know, you know, perhaps partly funded by the taxpayer, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know, working. Why? Because it gets you into the habit of not thinking about yourself, thinking about someone else. Um, it gets you into a habit of engaging with people who are out of your political or your social class at a time when everyone's locking themselves in these gated communities. It puts the Duke's son together with a kid on the housing estate. So that's a, be those are be that's a beautiful thing. Um, and at a time when British society is becoming increasingly am atomized and increasingly socially uh, and economically stratified, it would make an enormous difference to do that. Now, I think that's a perfectly reasonable Burkean view. And yet it, it, it's, it's not in some respect a, a libertarian conservative thing by any means. And it would be, might be compatible with the kinds of viewpoint you're describing. My favorite British politician, uh, Lord Melbourne. His motto was delay. You probably know much more about him than I do. I, I, I love David Cecil's great biography, um, delay. Uh, how does Lord Melbourne and Burke relate to each other? What, what, would, what would you say? Well, <laughs> um, I mean, the answer is I'm, uh, I couldn't tell you what the specifics are. But as you know, um, um, I mean, um, Melbourne is a figure who grows up and it achieves his political maturity in the in the um, 1830s, and he is um, uh, very much. Uh, I mean, obviously on the weak side of the political divide, and um, so he is an inheritor of, a, in many ways, that that respect for Burke that really fires up in the in the first quarter of the 19th century. So he's operating within that within that uh, framework. Now, what is interesting about, um, uh, about delay as a slogan is that um, it, does, it does capture something which is 
which is rather distinctively Burkean in a way. One is, um, it's not about us, if you know what I mean. It's not about what my, my particular ambitions or goals are. It's about, as it were, letting things. It, it's also, there's a sense that things will sort themselves out. You know that lovely line of Alpha Balfour's? But Balfour's a thoroughly undistinguished prime minister, as you know, the only philosopher to be in prime minister of Britain, um, and therefore a dud of the first water. But, um, but, Balfour, but Balfour has his line. He says, he, says, he, says, he says, nothing matters very much and very little matters at all. And that's, a, you know, at one level, that's a very kind of lordly, aristocratic thing to say. At another level, it's saying um, we can be as passionate as we like, but as, when we're governing, we have to govern with dispassion. You know, there's a kind of, there's a kind of non-frenetic engagement that allows us, it's really, the, as it were, the appropriate attitude. Um, and uh, uh, and, and, and al although Burke is in his own practice, particularly at the end of his life, kind of the opposite of that. I mean, he's a kind of whir of activity. Um, in the, in, and, and often quite dyspeptic and angry and disappointed and frustrated with his own lack of political success. Um, I think that, that thought is very compatible. And, and the other just reference I would make, because it's a great favorite of mine, is, is this idea of negative capability that you find in Keats. You know, the holding off from something until the moment is right to, as it were, resolve it or address it or to take action. And, and that's, that's, I think, also a very powerful and important idea and, and, and not quite the same as either ignoring a situation or um, just delaying forever. It seems to me that, that uh, yeah, a lot of what you said resonates with, uh, certainly with, with, with what Melbourne's thinking, but there's also an element of the experience of the French Revolution and the sense that somehow there's a progression in um, free political life towards possibly including more and more people in that fear of mob rule. And um, uh, Melbourne's view seems to be that kind of the, the more you can slow things down, the more you can tame it, the more you can bring people in, but that nonetheless there is a kind of a pessimism implied in that view that ultimately maybe things don't go well in democratic uh, political life. Maybe f democratic f in democracy and freedom prove hard to uh, maintain together. Any, any thoughts on how? I mean, of course, one of the reasons why um, a Birkin approach is not merely, as it were, um, uh, good theory but good practice is because h human institutions operate in time um, and therefore they take time to operate. And the effect of that is that, um, uh, is that um, there is a premium to be placed on not acting quickly. Because acting quickly, almost by definition, is not allowing a set of affairs to adjust itself to whatever change you're making, and therefore destroying social capital, settled understandings, wisdom, in that sense. And w one of the things that comes out of the French Revolution is this enormous fear of convulsive change. Um, and, and, and if the counterpart of that is a feeling of um, uh, 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 a kind of um, um, a feeling of, of a lost golden age and that somehow we're all quietly going to the democratic dogs, that wouldn't be entirely incompatible with Melbourne thinking, I don't think either. Yeah, you stress the, um, the coincidences between Aristotle's thought and, and Burke's thought, and I was wondering if you thought about the, what the differences are and why Burke would have disagreed with Aristotle on those points, or if you, or if you don't see any differences. Um, it, it's a huge issue. And Aristotle writes about everything. Um, so I couldn't begin to um, give a proper answer to that question. Um, I, I haven't actually ever really asked myself, in, I mean, there are obviously are points of, of detail, uh, I mean, and, and probably enormous points of principle. Um, but I haven't really ever given them any thought. I've just been very struck by points of, of, of evident coincidence. Um, you've set me thinking. I mean, I, you won't hear a politician say, I don't know, but I'm very good at it. And this is one of those ones which I just haven't reflected on it. Um, but I will have by the time we next speak. And if anyone has any thoughts on this, I'd be really interested to know what the answer is, because I haven't. I, well, Harvey knows, I mean, it's a joke, me talking about this at all. I should, be, I should be passing the mic to Harvey on almost all these things anyway. So.
at odds with Aristotle's words of philosophy. What do you think? I know, but it's, I wanted to. to it's a slightly no, sharp, answer, slightly sharper version. Answered it, but you no, didn't the answer. answer. I think Jesse's answer. He said it. Aristotle wrote about everything. Yeah. Mm. He's a but philosopher. That's, <laughs> well, that's, that's certainly true. But I wanted to sharpen it to see whether Harvey could think of something. I would say the idea of founding is much more um, welcomed in Aristotle than in Burke. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the, the, possi the, the idea of a, a philosopher uh, with the aid of political science um, um, remaking or, or redoing or conceiving a best regime. There's no best regime in, uh, in Burke. Mm. He's fi he finds the best regime in uh, England's actual regime. And it's, uh, um, I mean, Aristotle also has this other side to him, this more reformist side, and other, other parts of his book is done. And, and uh, there, there uh, a, a lot of Burke, Burkean gradualism enters. Uh, but he, uh, he, he does, he wants to keep the best in view, I would say, always. And, uh, and, and uh, That's Burke, really Burke, is, Burke is more That's really afraid of that. So, so you mean in, in, in sort of debates on the ideal forms of government, you know, aristocracy versus, you know. Yeah, you know, democracy, and you know, you know, he has, uh, and, uh, yeah, and he, star he starts from the beginning in the way <laughs> yes. that uh, Burke yes. thinks uh, in yeah. his Burke doesn't have an ideal situation. conception of what a government ought to look like, yeah. as it were, from which the current government is in some sense a derogation. Right. No, that's absolutely right. I, I had two questions, but I'll just ask one uh, maybe later. And I also wanted to remark that the lady who's asked the, the question is, uh, is a scholar of Xenophon. Oh, interesting. And, uh, and, and, you know, Burke had this great, uh, expressed this great admiration for the ancients. We and the English still mm -hmm. read the, uh, uh, the ancients. And I think none of them more at that time than, than Xenophon. You get the same uh, respect for celebration, indeed, of of the gentleman. Mm. Horseman, are you are you working on? Yes. yes. She's uh, translating Xenophon's treatise on horsemanship. And so, right. Yeah. How amazing. So yeah. So uh, there is this um, uh, there is th this kind of connection between uh, between the two of uh, um, uh, that particular ancient. How fascinating. Yeah. I've never read it. How very, very interesting. I'd love to read that. Yeah. Um, the, the, of course, one of the things that's so fascinating is, is, is that what people take in classical civilization as their models changes between one era and the next. You know, and um, so we've, we know, we have, there's, there are points where people are reading Xenophon, there are points where they're reading Thucydides, there are points where they're reading Herodotus. And, you know, we're inventing a scientific conception of history based on one, or we're inventing a much more vernacular and social conception based on another, and a conce or a conception of character based on a third. So that's, that, that is interesting. Yeah. Well, 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 one question was that I had was, um, you presented Burke as a kind of oppositionist as a, somebody who was mainly concerned of, about abuses of, of power. Mm. And um, um, and, he, and he didn't spend much time in government or in, uh, in so, you know, with the, with the Rockinghams. And yes. Uh, so they had a brief period, and his thoughts on the cause of the present discontents uh, seemed to be a way of uh, um, justifying their opposition to the monarchy and <laughs> the, the, the chief uh, um, duty or of, a, of a party is, is to uh, present a, a solid and loyal front uh, in, in, uh, uh, as against uh, the, the king's uh, sort of un, unprincipled choice. Yes, the double cabinet. Yeah, the double cabinet. And um, he defines party as uh, a body of men united on some principle. That <laughs> that, uh, so he doesn't specify what the principle is because I guess he wants to have more than one party. Yeah. And, uh, well, or, or, also party that, or also that people might come together yeah. with overlapping principles uh -huh. in some way, some, yeah. some cluster. Right. Uh, 
So, but even so, even party here seems to be more an instrument of opposition than of of governing. It's not the the the, the staying united is not so difficult for a government because it's got the uh, attractions of office holding and to, uh, the, the glue of power and money. money. Now, but now compare this, the, however, to the uh, sort of the, the 19th century and maybe 20th century view too of the British Conservative Party mm. as a governing party. Mm. Didn't they? Weren't they always very proud of it? That, mm. they, that they held office longer. They were, they were not. Uh, um, I saw the, you know, Disraeli, yep. Salisbury. They, they were not ideologues who insisted on a principle that would uh, uh, you know, make them tire of holding the reins. Yes. And and <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and and want to have a take a sabbatical yes. From, uh, yes. from governing the country. So, so how, would, how, would, how would you reconcile those? Are those two kinds of conservatism, or is it just one thing uh, with different faces? Um, how interesting. Well, um, I mean, there's something absurd about my answer to the question from you, Harvey, because you've forgotten thousands of times more stuff than I will ever know about Burke. Um, um, uh, but let me, have a, let me have a hack at it. It really, it really isn't. The thing would have been true when you wrote your book on Burning Brook and Burke, which I still think is an absolute masterpiece. Um, okay, so so I would say, um, I, I mean, I think you're right that 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 I mean, that Burke holds office for under two years in um, a career of thirty. So it's not really surprising that he's constantly leading campaigns from outside government to try to make change. Um, and, you know, we don't call it, I don't call it the first great backbencher, but he's certainly one of the first great backbenchers. Now, um, uh, when he, and of course, when he is in, par in, in power, I mean, in, in the early 1780s, um, when the Rocking Whigs finally come back in in 1782, having held power, having, having been out of power for 16 years, united around, more or less united around a set of principles that, um, you know, for the first time in history in Britain, um, uh, uh, you know, they're only in, they only come back in for less than a year, and he's, um, he, and he's involved in, in passing his, uh, his bill on um, economical reform. So, and his bill on economic reform is about constraining royal power um, at, at that time. So even in government, it's a, his, his, his view of the exercise of power is often about restraining, restraining its abuse. Um, but I don't really think that, that his view of party is oppositional as such. Uh, I would say that it's trying to bring public principle and a recognition of human emotion and affection and loyalty. It's trying to foreground those in, public, in, a, in the public understanding of parties. And that's important because it's steering a conception of party away from adventitious gatherings of people united by the desire for power or the desire for office or money um, uh, and, to and leavening it with a public, a public deliberation over principles that, that um, doesn't really sustain it out of office but actually gives it a higher purpose when it's in office. So I think I would disagree with you on that. Now when you look at the Tories in power, it's certainly true that conservatives, the Conservative Party is often not very conservative, that's in the nature of the beast. Um, uh, it, I, in my read of it, the conservatives, conservatism is not a stable body of thought. It's, a slightly, it's intrinsically, um, it's a body of principles which are intrinsically in some tension with each other, if not in consistency. And so the skill is to choose the principles that suit the moment from the point of view of the gaining of power and then the exercising of power. And of course, if you want to regard that derogatorily, you can regard that as selling out in order to achieve, you know, magpies who just pick something that's going to get them elected and then do whatever they like. Um, actually, when it's done well and properly, I it isn't that, but um, it's obviously often caricatured that way. Um, when you look at the, the, uh, the Conservative Party is, as a matter of fact, I think with the exception of one party states, the, the most successful single political party in any in any country, in terms of the amount of power it's held over a sustained period of time. Um, one of the reasons for that is because it, it isn't particularly ideological. 
and it never has been particularly. I mean, there are moments when it becomes ideological, i.e., kind of doctrinally dominated, and we had a moment of that in the 1980s. And um, um, but by and large, it hasn't been. And and the reason it hasn't been is because these principles are eddying around, people are arguing about them. And it also, it also has to do with the nature of the people who are in there. They tend to be more independent-minded. They often have come from other backgrounds where you know, they've, 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 you know, they often come later into parliament. They're not from academic backgrounds. They're often from a spread of backgrounds which give them a slightly different view of things. They're often a bit richer and therefore a bit more independent. Um, so, um, whereas if you contrast, interesting, if you contrast the Labour Party, the Labour Party is much more tribal. So when the Labour Party gets into an argument, it's really a very, very vicious argument, and you know, um, uh, it's only you know, and and you know, there have been moments where it's where it's it's been unable to function because of that, because of that tribality and that level of of hatred. And you may have seen in Britain just in the last um, week, a man called Damien McBride has published his his um, memoirs of acting as the spin doctor for Gordon Brown. And I mean, it's completely, you know, I mean, <laughs> just you know, do not show it to your children. I mean, it's appalling. You know, the kind of absolutely unprincipled way in which he's prepared to destroy people's careers on the basis of private information and secret briefings. Um, you know, I mean, no party is immune from. The author or Gordon Brown? Well, well, of course, there's this ridiculous argument where they're all trying to shield the Prime Minister, but the Prime Minister is saying, who will rid me from this turbulent priest? I mean, there's no. There's no, uh, there's no real. You know, it's perfectly clear who the ultimate author is. But, um, but I mean, and, and of course, no party is immune from this. I'm sure there have been, you know, e e you know, evil moments in the Conservative Party's history. I'm sure that's true. But, but, but this is really, really vindictive, really aggressive, really sustained. And it, it is. There is something about the different parties which, which, which that captures. And it's. Um, uh, uh, it, I think it is related to some of these social, sociological factors, as well as some of the arguments about the nature of the, the principles involved. Hi, thanks. I was wondering about uh, how you might go about updating the theoretical foundations you find in Burke as a working politician. I was interested that you mm. uh, uh, said that earlier. And specifically, I'm interested in ideas of, as Professor uh, Devine said, history and also nature, which comes up a lot in, in Burke. Uh, we can't really talk about those anymore. They're not really acceptable, I assume, in, uh, in, in Parliament. So if you are going to make Burkean arguments, how do you go about updating those? And uh, if you have to abandon them, are you abandoning something that's absolutely fundamental to Burke, or are those just um, more rhetorical or uh, useful arguments for Burke? So that's sort of okay. That's that's uh, that's a, that's another really interesting question. Okay, let's 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 pick up three areas where I think we can think about updating. Um, of course, there's something silly about updating principles. We're really just talking about changing context in which principles are being applied, or bringing new principles in that are kind of consistent with the overall view. Um, uh, uh, I mean, in, take nature, for example. Now, um, uh, it's, it's a natural extension, if you'll pardon the pun, of Burke's emphasis on the social order to think of the natural order as being something that is also an inheritance, and therefore, which it is our job to sustain. There's a naturally environmental quality about Burke's conservatism. Um, and it's amazing that in general, conservatives in this country and in Britain haven't made more of this. And it provides a natural dividing line in politics between what you would, again, if you'll excuse the word, but natural, um, between, between people who want to spend money um, on, on um, e environmental policy and people who don't want to spend money. I mean, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we have an enormous debate in, our, in, in Britain about whether or not we should be spending a fortune on wind farms and you know, um, dubious carbon capture and storage technologies, which no one really understands. Um, uh, insulating your house, um, you know, protecting biodiversity by not wiping out things, or by you know, th that argument kind of gets ignored. They say, well, but actually, that's much more conservative. Kind of, there's a whole strand of good conservative arguments which are about protecting the environment um, without spending a lot of other people's money or uh, extending the power of the state into people's lives in a way that is inimical to their functioning or to their freedom. Um, if you're interested in this, um, you might want to look at a book called Green Philosophy by 
Roger Scruton, um, um, which kind of talks about that. Um, uh, another area would be history. Now, th th of course, uh, you've said history, and I wasn't quite sure what you meant, but one word we haven't discussed at all and mentioned, which is an absolutely Burkean word, is, is prejudice. Um, now, prejudice doesn't mean um, what we would think of it of, which is you know, racial prejudice in that way, etc. It means, it means the Im embedded set of understandings or instincts that we have in our experience, which we, consult without, which we don't need to consult to know what they are and to act on them. Now, um, of course there are arguments about prejudice in that wider sense, um, um, but the recognition that there are operating principles that are of value which we have inherited and which w we, we can obviously scrutinize and develop and extend, but we should recognize as being of value and because they allow us to act swiftly and decisively and um, in, in you know, uh, uh, a way that preserves these settled understandings. That, that's quite important. That's a kind of anti-rationalist understanding because you're not submitting everything to the tribunal of reason and then deciding, and therefore you're not submitting everything to the tribunal of an individual's imagination or, or, um, uh, or, or a desire. That's, I think, quite an important element that we could recover and extend in a modern Burkeanism. Um, the third one would be economics. Um, I mean, you know, economics hadn't really developed as a science. I mean, uh, in Burke's time, uh, the wealth of nations is a kind of digest in some respects and the foundations of the thing rather than, um, uh, uh, in as well as being a, a treatise in its own right. Um, but of course, if you think what's happening now, we, we have all these feedback loops in which certain sets of understandings about economics become culturally reinforcing. So, so you know, we're supposed to believe that, you know, uh, out of a certain neoclassical conception of human, uh, of economic activity, that, you know, ma mankind is, broadly speaking, profit-seeking and loss-avoiding and, uh, you know, um, best understood in terms of markets functioning under conditions of perfect information and no friction and all that sort of stuff. Well, Burke's going to say, hold on a second, a market is not to be rarefied in this way, is not to be uh, uh, divorced from a human context. The market is a means of satisfying a set of particular needs, and, 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 and you might need to intervene to make a market function effectively. This is, a, this is an insight that eludes many libertarians. Um, you, know, you might want to intervene to improve, to increase the amount of um, uh, competition in the market, for example. Um, or you might want to have, a market, you might want to have a, a market where you want to reduce the amount of competition because too much competition is actually hurting well-being because it's making everyone too short-term. Um, I'll give you a very simple example, which is this. Um, uh, uh, do you know, if you come to the, of the winner's curse, so you have a public procurement. Okay, we well want to build a piece of infrastructure. Um, so you might say, well, do we put it out to, uh, how many people do we put it out to? If you put it out to 50 people, okay, or to 50 organizations, um, then uh, I can guarantee you that the winning organization on price will be not one that's able to discharge that without a loss to itself and therefore probably a loss to you. Okay, so the smart Birkin doesn't put it out to that many people. Yeah, they're aware of the winner's curse and they operate within a context of understanding the nature of the institution that they're dealing with as well as the nature of the institution of the market. So those would be the kinds of examples I think one might use. If Burke had a conception of unintended consequences um, and thinking about that in relation to your most recent comment about the need to regulate markets, let's say in cases where there's not enough competition or too much co or competition has gotten out of hand, because it could of course very well be the case that you think that there's a problem, but it doesn't follow from that that your solution will achieve the intended results, um, however well designed it is. So then the question becomes, you know, how skeptical are we to be in deciding these matters? Um, so, if, you know. Um, uh, thanks for that. Uh, I mean, of course, the word, un phrase unintended consequences is a modern phrase. Um, but the idea is hanging over Burke. Um, it's sitting there. I mean, w w uh, w one of the worries that he has about the French Revolution is precisely that when, you've, when you are undertaking social revolution, total revolution, um, you know, um, uh, uh, there's a famous line of Ernie Bevin, who was an English um, politician of the uh, mid-century, uh, where he says, he says, open up that there Pandora's box, and who knows what Trojan horses won't jump out of it. And that is the precise <laughs> description of Burke's worries about um, these uh, 
uh, uh, these radical changes. Um, um, uh, of course, if you take institutions seriously, uh, and, and therefore you're embedded in a historical, time-bound conception of how they develop, you're automatically going to be worried about things like too much competition because you're going to worry that um, institutions which haven't had a chance to take root can be flattened by, by um, uh, too much. So, th and, and there, you, you might, if you're interested, you might want to look at um, this stuff. Uh, uh, do you know this man, Harjun Chang? 23 Things You Didn't Know About Capitalism. He wrote, he wrote a great book um, called Bad Samaritans, which is about how the uh, uh, international aid is kind of destroying um, things. And, and one of the things that, that he points out is that this idea of, of introducing um, you know, competition without actually asking yourself the question, is the context ready for that? And if so, how much? Is, is very characteristic of bad developments. Right? Open up a market. I mean, and if I can give a Harvard-specific example, which may titillate, um, I was living in Warsaw in 1989 uh, when Jeff Sachs arrived with his economics team and advised the Poles to deregulate prices. Now, the decision was taken to deregulate um, wholesale prices in the farm sector before they deregulated retail prices because everyone was worried that the effect of deregulating retail prices would be revolution. So um, they eliminated all price controls over wholesale prices um, um, and the following day the entire pig population was slaughtered uh, and the reason is because a pig is a sum of value <laughs> based on a certain cost and set of inputs and a certain set of outputs and if you have a suppressed output cost and your input cost goes through the sky you automatically um, don't want a pig because it's just eating up resources. Um, unfortunately, these guys hadn't really asked themselves what, what is the nature of these markets that they were involved in. The result was chaos. Um, so there are lots of examples where a more nuanced understanding of institutions in economics leads to better policy making. Come back to me in a moment. I can see I haven't persuaded you, but we'll go to this gentleman at the back. Sir. Uh, I have a similar question, uh, not to, to Jake's, but to the one that came before. Um, and it's that Burke makes a lot of sense to me in context. Uh, his aristocratic uh, view of political participation that we already went over, his Aristotelian or common law view of history and uh, respect for tradition, mm. that all makes a lot of sense uh, to me, given who he was, when he was. Uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on to what extent a, a Burkean brand of conservatism is confined or is maybe just best suited to those types of, um, those types of, uh, I guess, political and, and, and uh, traditions and environments. And I specifically have in mind like the, the new democracies that have emerged in the past two or three years, mm. like in North Africa and the Middle East, mm. that don't really have this uh, same kind of political, legal, there is some cultural, but there's competing cultural traditions. Mm. What, to what extent, or does a uh, Burkean conservatism work there, or, or does it? Does it maybe come in at a later point in a society's development? Well, of course, um, the first thing a, a, a Burkean view um, would say about those things is um, that you're, you're likely to get precisely the kinds of unintended consequences that were raised before. So don't do any premature rejoicing when you've just abolished an entire set of institutions um, uh, and, and allowed uh, um, uh, as it were, an, an often extreme religious set of um, people to kind of start uh, slugging it out with others. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're certainly going to get, um, you know, so the idea that somehow, you know, th in North Africa, bliss was it in that dawn to be allowed to be young was very heaven. I mean, it's complete nonsense. It was not, it's nonsense the French Revolution, it's nonsense the African Revolution. You know, these things have to be allowed to coalesce. What does coalescing mean? It means, um, if it's, if it's allowed to happen and is able to happen properly, first of all, it, a pure process is going to take a lot of time. Second of all, a process involves the establishment of institutions that are, um, as it were, um, uh, filling up this space that we've described um, between the state and the individual. Um, uh, thirdly, a, a conception of government that is porous and reflects popular opinion without necessarily 
being precisely bound by it or, 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 or as it were, automatically responsive to it, that it kind of leavens and stabilizes public opinion and public interest. Um, and, and, you know, the, um, so the first thing you're going to feel is, is a sense of extreme nervousness about these changes. Um, is, is a Burkean conservatism therefore irrelevant to that? Absolutely not. I mean, it is, it is almost prescriptive of what the kinds of changes are that you need to see. Um, um, on the other hand, do you get those by bringing in lots of experts who tell you what to do when they actually don't know anything about what's going on locally? Um, very often, not. Um, so it, it, it does act as a kind of check on official self-certified expertise. Um, and again, that, that would be true now in North Africa in a way that it would have been true in the new um, democracies of Eastern Europe that I was touching on earlier on. And, and what's quite interesting is if you look at um, Eastern Europe, there, there was a quite clear distinction between um, a kind of invisible line running down Eastern Europe, um, east of, of Poland. Um, and, and I remember particularly crossing around about the city of Lviv in the Ukraine. And, and that's interesting because that's the outpost of the Polish-Lithuanian empire, which comes out like that. And, and so between the wars, that's a democracy. Okay, um, and, and uh, after the Second World War, it, gets, it becomes absorbed. It gets, you know, as you, as you know, um, it gets absorbed into the Soviet uh, empire. Um, but the fact that it was a democracy between the wars means that there were still folk memories of independent institutions. And therefore, when privatization took place in Poland, they knew who had owned these properties beforehand. They were able to allocate them that. So they were able to recreate a middle class in which these institutions could start to flourish again. Everyone knew who owned Vedel, the chocolate factory in Warsaw. You know, these, these kinds of things. You go to the eastern side, you go to the, the Russian side of Ukraine, and that, that, that folk memory has gone, and, and those institutions are going to be much harder to recreate and redevelop. And it's precisely that Burkean flair, not the... Um, as it were, neoliberal, libertarian, or the socialist statist view that gives you a flair for what those differences are. Well, I think... Uh, I'm amazed by your resilience, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for, for coming, uh, Jesse. It's, a, it's been a great pleasure. It's been the pleasure. It's been a huge pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.